I went to Starbucks. You know, they have over 800 million combinations of their drinks, and none of them are small, medium, or large. Now, that's a lot of skews to plan. Anyway, I got my tall, iced, skinny, sore, caramel latte, extra shot, light ice, no whip. Hey, sunshine, this one's for you. Let's get to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Another episode of IBF On Demand. I'm your caffeinated, confused, and not so humble host, Eric Wilson. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That's eric at ibf.org. As always, thanks for the follows, the subscribes. Find me on LinkedIn, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Follow me there as well. I love to hear back from you. DM me, or said, or send me an email. We do have a sponsor for this as well, Arkiva. Driving Business Transformation by Solving What Others Cannot. I want to thank you, Arkiva, for once again sponsoring these podcasts. I do want to mention real quick, we have an exciting conference coming up in October. Check it out at IBF.org. We have our flagship event coming up in October 18th through 21st in Orlando. And as I mentioned, in person I'm coming out of my bunker for this one. I'm excited about this one. We got one day boot camp for members. We got one day leadership for leaders. We have two days forecasting, SNOP, subject matter experts, networking, food, fun, follies, whatever it's going to be. But exciting conference in October 18th through 21st. Come check it out. It's going to be an exciting opportunity to come down and network and hear from subject matter experts from around the world. One of the best conferences we do. I'm actually going to be there. I hope you can make it too. IBF.org. Check out the details for that one. I want to take full disclosure up front. I'm a Dunkin' guy. So that said, Starbucks actually first showed up in my book, Predictive Analytics for Business Forecasting. You check that out. I actually did a spotlight on some of their best practices uh, doing some interviews and, and working with them in the past. So I did a spotlight with on their on the planning. They have successfully digitized your loyalty and used nine, 90 million transactions a week to get you to even spend more. You think $5 for a tall is a lot. They want you to spend even more. And they're using your royalty and all the transactions along with other things as well to create an experience for you, a personalized experience for you, but then to upsell you as well. They have created what they call the Digital Flywheel Program. It correlates customer purchases, store locations, meteorological data, inventory data to predict and help drive more cost-effective sales inside their stores. I don't like the words AI, but they are using next-level stuff here to micro-target, personalize your offers on your smartphones to get you to be more engaged, to be, you, get you to be more loyal to their brand and buy more. You may think by what I'm saying right now, Starbucks has cracked the code. They have gone next level on us. Guess what? There's still limitations even to their planning. It's still people, process, then technology. They are successful, not because some of their data scientists and some of the data they have and the technology they're doing. They're successful because of their people and their process. They succeed not only because of the data, but skilled people and good processes. Even they have limitations to what they can do in their planning. And we're going to actually talk about some of those real limitations and how they go to get over them today. I have a very special guest. Brian is 10 plus year career of demand, SNOP experience in CPG, retail, e commerce, B2B planning with industrial leaders like Starbucks, Hershey's, Chewy.com, and Cargill. He's currently actually the senior demand planning manager at Starbucks. If you ask him why he loves demand planning, 
he would say he loves the process of helping a business evolve and transform through the planning and IBP process. Help me welcome Brian. So welcome, Brian. Happy you're here. I got my Starbucks for you, so I'm glad you can join us. Thanks for having me today, Eric. Good to see you again. Yeah, I know like, Starbucks actually did a, a, a spotlight on him in my predictive analytics book, uh, talking about some of the advanced things that you're doing, some evolutionary, some revolutionary things that you guys are doing there. And, and when people think of Starbucks beyond just the great coffee, people think of the analytics, the data uh, from a planning perspective. But it, when you actually get into behind the scenes, some of the planning, it, it's it's still not not as far as it advanced and, and some of the analytics. You deal with problems everybody else is facing is what I'm trying to say. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we, we're still experiencing some disconnects. Uh, you know, we don't have full visibility end to end and some of our, our planning tools and integrating a lot of that different those different data elements that we would love to just be able to hit one button, click, get a result. Um, so, you know, we're still trying to work through some of those things as most businesses are, but uh, we're definitely uh, closing some gaps here or there, but we have a long way to go. So, I mean, so that's interesting. And people always think of, I mean, they put these people on pedestals and guess what? Your planning's just like everybody else's planning and it's still people process and, and it's still focused on really getting these pieces together. You're struggling with the same problem. So what are some of the biggest limitations you're seeing in, in technology today? So if we had to just, let's just have a frank conversation here. What are some of those big limitations that you see that probably everybody else is seeing as well? Yeah, so I'd say, you know, not even just specific to Starbucks, but just uh, end, to, end to end planning is something we all talk about. We've been talking about for years, but that is that is something where it's great to come up even with a demand plan. And, and that's difficult enough. And we all know that. But being able to see what the implications are, whether that's inventory strategies, production and uh, storage capacities, truck lanes, impacts of fuel prices. You can get, kind of go down a lot of different rabbit holes, obviously, of, of the different things we need to be able to assess and analyze. Um, but specifically from a demand planning perspective, I think where where I see most companies and most of my colleagues still struggling is just the, the, the massive amount of data that's out there, the things we want to try to analyze, um, you know, a lot of it needs the data science integration and you need someone who has that capability, whether it's R or Python, to be able to pump some of that information in. But that's, that's when you know it's there. I think where, where I'm excited to see things potentially go with this is is having, having a system that can go through thousands or millions of uh, external and internal factors and really help you uh, design your modeling capabilities uh, to make, make that scenario planning so much more robust um, and, and to really bring the business along with where your potential is. Um, even things like pricing scenarios and the impacts of those or mixed simulations so you could really evaluate your uh, innovation and portfolio strategies, just really making informed decisions on those things so you can move as one collective business unit. Um, I think will help bring everybody in the business along and make more effective decisions in the end. Uh, so that's interesting. I mean, I mean you can at a company that has 900 million transi- transactions a week. I mean, those are the ones that you know. You mentioned these these unknown variables. Uh, I mean, there, we've had a lot of unknown variables over the past few years that's kind of impacting. Are you seeing the capability of bringing those into our modeling then as well as is, is, is becoming a necessity? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll maybe hone in on a more specific example. But uh, one of the things I was thinking about this morning, funny enough, is with COVID, um, you know, we've talked a lot about unpredictability and all of the business shifting we've seen. But one example is the, the massive population shifting we've seen. I mean, uh, within three years, it's been a mass move and people leaving places like New York, moving to Florida, California, moving to Texas. How are businesses trying to get ahead of that and make sure that uh, that your footprints there. Imagine you're a retailer that has a footprint like a Starbucks, you know, as you're thinking about how your store footprint is out there and getting ahead of your competitors. I mean, having that information where everyone's shifting to and the demographics that are shifting there, that's hugely powerful uh, to be able to influence your plans. So um, that's just one example of many, but, um, you know, something that I think this type of technology that we're talking about should enable at some point in the future. Okay. So what, I mean, we're talking, hey, this is what the limitations of technology are. It's topic for today. So hope technology providers, you're listening. So we have visibility seems to be the first one. You're saying, hey, we want more visibility. The second one is we need to bring in more variables 
uh, especially external variables into our planning process and be able to run more scenarios. Uh, those are the two. Is there would be anything else that you'd really kind of see as a limitation of today? Is there interconnectivity between different type scenarios and functions? Is, is that part of the problem you're seeing as well? Yeah, absolutely. Like I mentioned, I think there's the end to end capabilities and being able to assess uh, all those outcomes. Um, but maybe maybe one thing that specifically comes to mind is what, what we would call either strategic planning planning or the budgeting process that companies would some companies would call it right. A lot of companies are doing this manually. They're doing it once a year, looking holistically at their business, figuring out what their strategic direction looks like. Um, but we're doing it with a lot of directional input sometimes, or we're projecting trends forward that maybe may or may not uh, actually make sense. But how informed are we of uh, just how how um, what is actually driving those plans, right? So just being able to integrate some of this information in there, thinking again, pricing scenarios, internal, external data to look at risks and opportunities. Uh, so you can look at the, those scenarios. Um, even if you, let's say, know the outcome that you're trying to get to, you have a revenue target or you already have a margin target even uh, for a more uh, refined IBP type of process, you can input that and theoretically back into how are the what are the different paths to getting there within your mix, within your pricing, within your customer base, regional approaches, whatever those different promotional strategies could be. Um, but, you know, really dialing in on how to optimize the business and, and get everyone understanding the risks and opportunities and having mitigation strategies to avoid those. I mean, I think that's what SNOP and IDP is all about. So it's really just getting a tool to get us get us there and take some of this um, annual type of planning. Uh, to me, that's a that's going to be an archaic topic in 15 years once we kind of overcome <laughs> these things, hopefully. <laughs> so, so, OK, so we we know some of the limitations you're having then. So, hey, let's give you that that magic paintbrush here. We're going on the magic school bus trip uh, into the future of what exactly would you want? If you had the perfect ideal system then uh, to be able to create in the future, what's some of those capabilities that future? You already mentioned some of those, but what exactly, as detailed as you can, what's this system going to look like in the future that we're going to be planning on? Yeah, I, I almost envision it like I, what comes to my mind is like an 80s stereo, right? There's a million dials and knobs and things like that. Obviously, we want most of this to be AI and machine learning uh, facilitated, but um, having the capability to kind of play with those dials and levers, um, whether that be, again, demographic data, uh, different pricing alternatives, looking at external data, looking at... Um, you know, just different things that, that you can impact even within your own business, whether that be marketing strategies, promotional strategies, uh, what you bring to the table from an innovation standpoint, just being able to run those scenarios, run that all pretty seamlessly um, and quickly. I think the challenge today in some cases is that there's still a lot of manual moving of parts around. You have to do item transitions, th things like that can be a little cumbersome at times. So getting that out of the planner's life and just focusing more on the actual analytical uh, scenarios and things like that, I think is the starting point. It obviously all starts with the demand plan. Um, but then it almost needs to go the, the whole way through the stream of the supply chain. So as, again, as we think about warehousing strategies, as we think about uh, ocean freight and things like that, what does availability and cost look like there? Um, and I think even to the point where you have really robust contingencies in place for something like that, we've seen ocean freights just go through the roof, obviously, with COVID or something like that. In a case like that, what kind of scenarios have you thought about as a business and put those things in place um, to, to drive your business in case you need to implement those uh, to steer a different direction? The tool should help facilitate those types of things just by analyzing and saying, what if we go this route? What if we produce domestically versus importing? Like, there's a, a lot of different interconnect connections, obviously, as we evaluate a supply chain. But to me, that's really the the value of integrating a true end-to-end -end type of capability is being able to assess the the entire way through and make decisions again uh, as a collective group with it. So I know that wasn't incredibly specific, but <laughs> oh no, I mean it's an interesting analogy you made there with the '80s. I mean, dating myself, I had the record player eight track cassette tape all in one and i thought i was you know the bomb because i had that you know console to be able to 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 be able to record and listen to my music on and now i got my smartphone that i'll listen to spotify and it recommends those you know i listen to imagine dragons and it's recommending agr to ajr to me because it says it's the same type of genre is that where we're going to start seeing where, where systems are going to start doing more and more of the planning for us in the future? Is, is, 
Oh, is the easy button going to be coming a, a, a thing in the future? You mentioned all the dials. All the dials going to go away, and we're just going to have that one easy button left? I think, you know, I, my vision of this, honestly, is that I think we still will always need the capability to be able to interpret and play with those dials um, uh, as we're looking at it. I think the system helps us with the, the information and understand the correlation and causal effects and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, we're still going to need the human intelligence. We're still going to need... Um, you know, you could have, I'll give you an example. Let's say it runs a mix scenario and it's like, hey, Starbucks, we want you to go into uh, some type of product we never sold before. Or we're not really heavily invested in. Well, we're still a coffee company. We want to be known as a coffee company. So, you know, there's still going to be that strategy and element of, uh, you know, the human marketing strategies and things like that that we want to kind of bring in, into play, for example. Um, but at the end of the day, yes, it should help with the heavy lifting. It should help us understand what is most impactful to the business, where we can steer uh, direction when needed. Um, and if there's risk and opportunity, just highlighting where those where those are in a, enough of a, lead, a lead time that we can steer a different direction if needed. Okay. So what, I, what I'm seeing then or hearing uh, is if you have demand, I always say is the predictive side of the equation. Uh, where you're trying to make the best projection of the future based on your data, the insights, the inputs. Supply is the optimization side of the equation where you're taking all the different levers you're talking about and you're optimizing it, which is going to be the best solution for your business and the predictive side of the equation. So really the integration of those two where you really have predictive and optimization becoming more seamless in the future is what you're really kind of driving towards uh, in your vision of that future technology. Uh, is that a good way of kind of framing it? Yeah, I think I think uh, the supply part's a huge piece of it. I mean, I think it, it extends into a lot of different areas and then you have uh, a lot of complexity. If you're sourcing materials, you have tier two, tier three suppliers and all those things. And that's the part, again, where it gets kind of hard to connect the dots nowadays. But um, I, th I think there's a lot of potential in just bringing that visibility together and, and being able to, you know, we, we know there's always going to be bumps in the road as you're, as you're uh, you know, we're trying to run a business and there's always going to be things that jump out at you. But it's having the best indicators of prediction, having the best indicators of where uh, that is, where you are coming off the rails a little bit and then being able to steer that in another course that's uh, going to optimize your business and allow you to hit your target still. I mean, that's that's the name of the game from my perspective. So the system just helps you get there. Okay. Well, I, I, the other thing I heard in there, too, is Skynet's not going to take over everything. There's still the people side of it. So I think we're okay there. But, okay, going back to reality now, because I love living in the future and talking about the what if and, and, and where we may be. And we mentioned some of the limitations we're seeing right now in technology. Coming back to reality of today, we're living in a new norm. We're facing the technology we have of today, uh, limitations or not. And we even started off saying, hey, even Starbucks, as advanced as you are with data and, and technology, there's still limitations even with what you're doing. How are you handling or dealing with those limitations today? What, what's, what's this, what, what are you doing for the day to, to get by? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, from my perspective, you know, I've been a manager eight years now, and the same principles always seem to work as far as having really robust exception management, having the right tools to understand the business and getting the right data out there. Um, sometimes you gotta be scrappy in how you pull it together, but um, just being you know clever and thinking of different ways of, of problem solving. Um, you know, I think getting away from shipment history is, is something that's been necessary, obviously, because shipment history, probably for most businesses over the last three years, is relatively worthless <laughs> as an input. So um, just trying to come up with creative ways, looking more at POS, get it, leaning more on that data so we can get real-time signals of where customers are going, where they're headed, um, and being able to kind of bring that together. Um, but largely, it's the same principles of forecasting that have always worked. It's having the right exceptions, having the right training, and getting the, the, the team up to speed, um, and just having... Demand planners know what to do when they need to do it, and uh, the rest kind of takes care of itself. I think the only other thing I'd say strategically is just being more vocal in the business and, and calling these trends out as we're seeing them. I've, I've seen demand planning emerge in a lot of different business settings over since COVID has hit. So it's a really it's 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 been an unfortunate uh, event for the world, obviously, but I think uh, we've seen a lot of. Uh, benefit on the demand planning side as more business leaders have recognized the value of demand planning um, and 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 also are willing to listen, I think, more to what demand planners have to say. So 
um, to me, it's, it's kind of a combination of those things. I'd agree there. I've definitely seen an increase in, in job postings for demand planning analysts uh, in this role. So I definitely see the importance and a lot of people going into this role. You mentioned that, too. I mean, besides the technology, it is process and then it is people then as well. I mean, you've been eight years putting together good teams is really still the fundamentals and core of what you're doing then. Hundred percent. If you don't have the right team in place, none of the rest of the stuff's going to come together. And um, it's it, demand planning today in in our current environment. It takes a lot of ingenuity. It takes a lot of creativity. You have to have the analytical capacity to to take a lot of different diverse inputs and bring them together and tell one singular story with it. Uh, you know, it's it's not a job everybody can do. And um, and if you don't set it up for success, it can put your business in a pretty bad spot if you're not watching. So, um, yeah, absolutely. The team is what it's all about today, for sure. So how, how do you really get those skill sets? How do you keep the people and the people side of it engaged? And as technology continues to evolve, keep, keeping them with pace and adapting to, to that then as well. Is there, is there a way that you really look at the people side of it and keeping them uh, informed and, and engaged? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm pretty hands on with my team as far as uh, working together, a very collaborative team. Um, and I always try to build that kind of environment. But I think it's a couple of things. I think you need to build trust with your planners of, that you're willing to back them up. We're going to take calculated risks in our plans. We're going to we're going to talk about these things. And I don't want uh, the team to be scared to, to call out opportunities and things like that. Um, so you got to be there from a support standpoint. I think also just having continual touch points and continuing to talk about how do we think bigger? How do we change the game? How do we bring in new data? Um, whatever those different things are of just encouraging an environment of creativity and again, bringing that ingenuity um, and giving them the platform to do it and bandwidth, um, you know, so that could be tools that could be uh, new approaches to analyzing data, whatever that might be. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's about just continuing to work together, continuing to push of how do we, how do we think better? How do we think bigger? Um, it's, it seems to be the recipe for success so far, at least. And I'd recommend external training in there as well. I know IBF uh, worked with Starbucks in the past. I, I recommend some uh, external training with that as well, keeping people fresh with new concepts and ideas as they happen as well. Absolutely. So I, I want to thank you for this opportunity to kind of understand what's happening behind the scenes and, and uh, kind of giving us some, some insights into maybe what's next in technology, but then – Equally important, what's important from the people side as well. So I want to thank you, Brian, for being part of this. Thanks, Eric. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. We learned a lot there, and we really truly understood that at the core, it's still people. There's people at the other end as well. We have to remember as well. We have consumers. And one thing we found through COVID, through all the disruptions we've seen, it's changed the consumer as well. And we have to understand their people as well. 75% of consumers have went to another product or another way of shopping and won't go back probably to the way they did. Brand loyalty has dissolved over the past few years. People have less loyalty to the brands they used to. There's less connection not only to other people, but to, other brand, to their current brands as well. People have always wanted that personalized experience. Now they need it more than ever. If you're not talking directly to the consumer, the way they want to be interacted with, how they and where or platforms they want, you may lose that consumer because they're not as loyal to you as they used to be. This becomes the need for predictive analytics for demand sensing and demand shaping. I said, it is a people side of the equation. This is a technology solution to help us engage with those people. We're utilizing technology now to really adapt processes to really micro-target these people. From a, from a demand sensing aspect, yes, we can be able to get this information quicker, be able to translate this information into usable insights that we can use inside to be able to react and be, uh, to what's going to happen. We can use it then to shift demand where necessary to be able to make up for previous shortcomings we had in our supply chain. For demand shaping, that's that next level stuff we talked about. 
That's really taking our message. And if we understand the levers, we understand the drivers of our business, being able to use those levers and drivers to help push new demand and help target the message to the consumer. The best forecast we can create in the future is the forecast of demand that we actually create. That's where we're going as, a, as an industry. That's where we're going as, as a field. And that's what we have to adapt to as well. So we have to understand that that really becomes a necessity to be able to understand those consumers going forward. But to do that, it's about people internally in your current organization as well. You need to develop those skills internally. You need to develop those processes internally. That's why I highly recommend look at IBF, some of the advanced trainings we have. We're going to be doing some online advanced trainings uh, in November. Check those out. Really talks about how we can really cater the messages, bring those insights, talks about demand sensing, all those things. Check out my book, Predictive Analytics. But even outside of that, start looking at new sources of data you have inside your organization. Find ways you can understand that consumer behavior better. Train your people you have to really become the next generation of demand planners, predictive analytics uh, analysts out there. It's a people process internally, and it's a people process we're de- dealing with externally. We can't really forget that aspect of what we do. Well, that does it for me. I was actually inspired through a text offer I just got to try a new Vinte Blonde Latte with whole milk and upsell to a blueberry scone. We'll see how that goes for me. My name is Eric Wilson. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That's eric at ibf.org. I want to thank Arkiva, driving business transformation by solving what others cannot. Thank you, Arkiva, for sponsoring as well. You want in person? Guess what? We have in person for you. Don't forget October 18th through the 21st, our flagship event. Registration is now open, so check that out at ibf.org. All the benefits of in-person interaction, building long-term relationships, plus phenomenal content. Some of the best from around the world is going to be there speaking. Um, I'm going to be there soaking it up as well. Chance to meet. Say hi while you're there as well. Check out ibf.org for the events page for the conference coming up in October. Also, we have the advanced conference coming up as well. That one is going to be virtual. Check that one out as well. And as always, as you're enjoying your coffee, as you're enjoying your scones, don't forget afterwards, wash your hands. Now I got nothing to do.